Well, welcome back to uh, GPS, God's Prophetic Surprise. Thank you for being with us today. And we're going to pick up uh, where we have been. We've been moving through Revelation. If you are new to us, just uh, understand we're going through Revelation verse by verse. We've been 40-some shows, and we're finally in Revelation 6. Uh, get a Bible and just join with us. We don't care what form. We have phones. We have a computer, whatever it is. Open up to Revelation 6. We're looking at the seven seals. And uh, just to set the background, if you're coming in a little fresh to us, we have been looking at the seven seals as a package, looking at uh, are they future, are they historical, or are they a combination of both? Are they literal or are they spiritual? And uh, we'll just sort of summarize that quickly and then go in. And uh, I want to get at that issue a little bit in another way. So the debate has been in the Adventist church and elsewhere, the usual interpretation has been the Revelation 6 and 7 or the seven seals going over history. And the four horsemen, starting from the first century, the white conquering horse being the first century all the way down to today, ending with the second coming. Another view that uh, is popular is that it's still future and that these uh, seals are still mostly coming and that they're literal. They're really going to happen, these kinds of disasters and uh, famine and war and all of that. So we have a little bit of a disagreement. Uh, John and I, uh, John is the scholar, so he's probably right, but I still <laughs> challenge a little bit. Uh, I would say that these are both. They are, first of all, in a partial way, historical, but the primary is still future, he would say, mostly historical, looking over the last 2,000 years, and mostly spiritual. And I think the big challenge, Dan, is, is the question, is this the type of prophecy that calls for double or multiple fulfillments, or is it the type of prophecy that has a single line? And uh, when it comes to Daniel, it's usually pretty clear. Uh, you can tell that chapter 3 is not a sequential prophecy. Chapter 2 clearly is. So in yes. Daniel, it's not so hard. <laughs> Revelation, uh, it can be sometimes difficult. And so I, I'll cut you a little slack for being wrong right. on this one. I, I always yeah. need that. <laughs> but just for fun, I wanted to uh, take maybe five minutes on the issue. Obviously, discussion and a TV show or theology is always premised on the idea that we might change our minds. Why study if we're not going to learn something? And that process of holding on to some beliefs, and then some beliefs maybe at times you'll say, maybe they need to be changed. We're trying to persuade people. So I've been thinking, and I asked you before we got on the air about the meetings. We had those meetings going on in London today. Uh, our church leaders from different unions around the world church are in London, and they are trying to study uh, the issue of unity in the church and how to handle the issue of women in ministry because the church is not monolithic. There are at least two or more views on that. And each side is hoping that the other will eventually see it and, and say, okay, you're right, I now see it. But few make that change. Most of the time, once people get into their understanding, it's that way. But if people don't change their mind, we have no reason to do evangelism. I go around the world and preach. You're assuming that people are going to come in and you will preach and people will change their mind and get baptized because they now say, I now see something I didn't see a month ago. What are the steps in the process, uh, real quickly, that lead to changing your mind? The Bible says, you know, eventually the whole world is deceived and they need to come to the truth and come out of Babylon and now receive the truth. They have to change their minds. What are the steps involved in changing your mind? Have you changed your mind? What are the steps when you have changed your mind on something? Can we do this quickly? I just want to get that issue I, just a little I, bit. I hate to say this as an institution, <laughs> but I think the primary... Uh, primary avenue for change in an institution is funerals. Is? Funerals. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, because you see, on a lot of the issues, Dan, that you and I are struggling with these days, Sarah's generation gets to decide. Yeah, referee. Yeah. You see, because in the end, we will not be there, and they will say, well, that didn't, you know, that didn't make But we're not going to die today. Sense, so. Today, today, we yeah. have to settle this. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I think the tendency is that we want to. You know, and I think, uh, I think when you look at us, you see us always struggling to, to solve these things, and you're kind of like, yeah, give it up, guys. But see, I think that's also because you guys have been in this, 
in the trenches, per se, for so long fighting for this one thing. We've forgotten right. we're in a trench. <laughs> right, well, maybe, maybe you've dug yourself down a little bit deeper in the trench than you realize, but I think there's something to be said about people having ownership. I will fight way harder on something that I've already, ha like I have a firm opinion on or I've researched out or whatever. Hammered out. And if it makes sense to me, I think it should make sense to everyone. However, the reality is, is everyone has different viewpoints and different realities that they live in. And so sometimes when we fight that, we realize near the end, like, wow, this really isn't that consequential. And people from the outside are like, this is the dumbest fight I've ever watched, you know? And it's just that really, it's like the- You have a seminary degree, you're ordained, you've been doing this a while, you have some <laughs> things that are settled. Yeah. Do, you ever, do you ever put any of those on the table and say, I've pretty well hammered that out, but you know, I may, I may have some of that that needs to be adjusted. Well, this is where I think some of my relatives and like extended relatives may refer to me as the hippie or the gypsy or whatever, because I think for me, I like other people's perspectives and I actually like them challenging me, so I have to keep reassessing whether or not I actually believe that. Because I think as society moves and as culture changes and as we have more understanding of like what was happening in the cultural context of these times and we can go back and study, we find out new things, new truths, as you would say, you know, pieces of the puzzle that help us develop a clearer thought. Where is the balance on that? You know, because Ephesians 4 talks about, you know, not being blown here and there. Right. So you're, you've got some roots. And we, we pray over new baptisms that they will be rooted and grounded in their faith. We talk about that. Right, but I think that's where God shows up, though. I mean, as a clinical chaplain, my favorite thing in the world was when someone would come in with a different concept of death or understanding of how to die well or whatever, and that would revolutionize my thought. And I'd realize, wow, there's a piece that I've been missing this whole time that doesn't alter my path or what I believe in, but it, it heightens it and makes it even better. So if God's truly God and he's that big, there's gonna be all these pieces that come in that we're gonna be like, no, we figured this out, this is right. And they're like, oh wait, God's really big. <laughs> Maybe this is a bigger conversation than what we've hammered out for the last hundred years. Good, good, good. You see, I, I think the big difference in the generations is, Dan, your, your generation and mine, we get into a fight in order to win. Mm -hmm. And I think her generation, when they see a fight, it's more like, what can I learn from this? Yeah, and we don't need, I think this, we want answers to some extent, but I also don't think we need an answer that we have to circle at the end of the day. I've seen you dig in on a few things. Oh, I will fight for things on principle <laughs> and when I'm moody. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes down to it, for the most part, like, yeah, there's some things I want. I want a clear answer because I'm impatient, but when we have time and we have time to think about it and there is no one answer that makes sense, I think a lot of us are okay with not having the answer and being like, wow, we don't know. <laughs> well, isn't that part of our Adventist tradition and heritage is that we believe in progressive revelation, is that what we know today may have to be adjusted tomorrow or next year. One of the coolest things I think that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has ever done uh, was the fundamental beliefs since 1980 uh, because there were stated 27 and now 28 convictions about what the scriptures teach. Mm -hmm. And those are laid out as descriptions, but also with a little bit of a sense, you know, we hope people will kind of get in line with that, you know, if they really want to be part of the community. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning is a statement that basically says, these 27, these 28 are where we see the scriptures today, but at some future time, we may get further light. We may uh, see some things a little differently. We reserve the right to change these Amen. and to, Amen. to modify them so that the Bible in the end will get the glory and not our brilliant committee that put these together. Very good. So I think, that, I think it's very important. There's the balance I think you were, you were talking about. Uh, the idea on the one hand, having some convictions, being able to stand for something, to look your boss in the eye and say, I'm not having it. Not uh, <laughs> that's okay, as long as we recognize that even in the midst of conscience, we could be wrong. Yeah. That's right. That's that sometimes right. a conscience is misguided. Paul says, don't cross your conscience, even if you're wrong. But, and this is, I think, a huge point, is, is I think people are so scared of the conversation, which is what's turning my generation off. When, when we approach a conversation, it's not because we're trying to throw a curveball and like mess up your entire theological experience and like tear down the Adventist church. It's more because we don't know if we understand how you got to that answer yeah. or that conclusion. And so I think that we need to be careful because so often when it comes to disagreement, people assume that you're fighting against each other. But I think as a scholar, you learn that you 
you challenge yourself best when someone opposes your view. Well, just know, when Dan and I argue about the white horse of Revelation, we're in it to win. Yeah. Okay, and so you have to sort of put that on a side. And that's why I'm sitting between and, you two. And, and learn, <laughs> from it, learn from it as much as you can, and then forgive us and move on. So. All right, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and we're having fun with it, but, but uh, on, a, on a deeper note, to come to come to truth with a little bit of humility and say, this is how I understand it today, yeah. as our preamble yeah. says, the Gray Bill preamble. Uh, and I stand in what I believe, and I believe I've hammered it out from Scripture, but I always reserve the right. Because I've had to change in the past, mm -hmm. I may have to change some more, and I may have to yield today. Mm -hmm. And uh, people may have to yield. We may yield to somebody who writes us this week and say, uh, we're wrong and you were right. We, we understand that that's possible, mm -hmm. and I want to do it. Otherwise, there's no hope when it says that there will be the spirit of truth at the end of the world, and there will be one body and one faith and one Lord. The only way that's going to happen is if some of us give up some cherished ideas and move to a center. Our church's whole history is based upon changing some huge ideas about God and about day of worship and, and many, how we get baptized and many things. Mm -hmm. And to say that now, because we've done all the changing we need to change and we have never have any more changes to make, I think is, is, not, is, not, is not helpful. And the Holy Spirit is coming to do more. And just remember, Dan, you said something really important right now, and that is we want our viewers to write and tell us when they think yeah. we're wrong and ask <laughs> questions, et cetera, and challenge these things right. because Only that's all part of... Only when they're wrong. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. You write when Sarah's right, okay? Yeah, so that's anyway. right. But uh, perhaps we can put on the screen uh, the, uh, the email address uh, where people can write us and, and get GPS. their question on GPS the at LOBN.TV. There you go. I think. Okay. All right. <laughs> Very good. All right. So let's, we'll pray, you know, for our church leaders in London and in Maryland and wherever they are, you know, that they will, they will be open to the Holy Spirit. Now, I told you I had one last point for you. Uh-oh. Wrestling with this idea, are the seven seals literal or symbolic? And are they mainly one interpretation or are they dual? So I expect to be wrong on this, but I will at least tell you what I wonder. Because I go to the sixth seal, which of course is the, the dark day and the moon being red and the stars falling. Mm -hmm. And the Adventist church has historically interpreted that to be 1780 and 1833. And we will look at these stories in my mainly New England where there was a dark day and 10 o'clock uh, people went back to their houses and to the barns or to church. And the moon was red that night and 1833 the stars fell. Uh, and then people did some research and said, okay, those are pretty natural phenomena and they were localized to one area in the whole world. So nobody in Mongolia or Australia got a dark day, just New England. And so I would probably make a stand for that was, number one, literal. It's not spiritual. It's not spiritual day of darkness. It's a literal day, number one. And number two, that was a precursor. It was a, a pre, a, a initial partial interpretation. And there will someday be a worldwide literal fulfillment of that one. So I believe that the stars falling and all that had two applications, one partial. I don't reject what the church leaders interpreted it 200 years ago, but I think there's going to be something more that is worldwide. What's the answer? Okay. Two, yes. interpret two fulfillments. Yes, they're literal then. You, that you, one's you, literal. You convinced me, yeah. <laughs> no. Well, when we, get to, when we get to the sixth seal, I'll go into it in more detail, but there's some hints in the Greek that suggests that sun, moon, and stars are intended to be taken literally in that spot. So, so your rule of thumb is there need to be some markers in the text itself. Well, uh, and, and, and where would I come after that? I would go back to chapter 1 and verse 1 where... Uh, of Revelation. Yeah, where the author lays this out. Uh, and it isn't always explicit in translation, but uh, the way this is the New American Standard says the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must shortly take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant John. Now, the word for communicated there, sometimes make known and, and things like that, that word for communicated uh, is the Greek word symbolize. 
We talked about this, yeah, I remember. Yeah. About a half a dozen times in the New Testament it appears, mm -hmm. and five of the six, it's something symbolic in the future. It's about the future, but it's in symbolic language. So right at the beginning, he's speaking about the whole book here. He says, this is a symbolized book. Does that mean every word is symbolic? No. Uh, that, that would probably be an excessive interpretation any way you come at it. Jesus Christ, when it appears, I think is to be taken literally, right? It's not a symbol of something else. Uh, you know, when, when, uh, when the Satan appears, uh, probably we're intended to understand an individual rather than just a force or an idea. So I would say that uh, when we come to chapter 6, it's primarily to be taken in, in a symbolic sense, but where it is clear that some sort of a uh, literal interpretation is needed, then we definitely uh, cool. look yeah. into that. Now, coming to the white horse just quickly, uh, yeah. and, and we, can, <laughs> we can continue with other directions if you want, but I was just gonna say there's three main interpretations of the white horse that relate to this symbolic literal. Uh, one of these, and actually my own doctoral um, external examiner from, uh, at the time, Notre Dame and later on uh, from Yale, uh, she believes it's literal. And uh, a number of scholars would agree with that, but those who see it literally relate it to the first century. Hmm. They say that in the, Roman, the threat to the Roman Empire came from the East, and that was the Parthian. The Parthian Empire, which is the, sort of the descendants of the old Persian Empire, it was the most powerful nation outside of the empire, was the Parthians, and they liked white horses. So the idea is, is that the white horse says at some point the Parthians are going to come and attack the Eastern Empire, and that, that will be a big threat to the empire. Hmm. Uh, the problem for us is if that's the best you can come up with as a literal interpretation, it never happened, and that means this is not a good prophecy. It, it's, it's a bad prophecy, yeah, and I would rather believe based upon uh, the, uh, the, the, how this relates to the rest of Scripture, that if this is truly inspired by God and God knows the future, that we would rather go with an interpretation that actually works. So, uh, I agree yeah. with that. So one of these is that this is literal, the white horse is literal, uh, and it represents literal military powers attacking the empire from the east. Second interpretation, is that the white horse represents Jesus and the gospel going out to the world, uh, presenting the, the, the message of the gospel. Uh, and then the other three horses will show reactions to that gospel. And then the third position is that uh, the white horse actually is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. That, uh, that we have here, you know, we have a white horse and a rider in chapter 19 is Jesus. Well, this one, has a different kind of crown, and he's in a different context, and uh, et cetera. So this must actually be a counterfeit of Jesus so the Christ. the first one is the Parthians one? The Parthians, that's the literal one. The second one. one is the Christ in the first century it's the, gospel, the gospel going to all the world. Jesus and the gospel going to the world. The third is the counterfeit. It's the counterfeit, yes. That the white horse is one of the four horses that all of them are on the satanic side. So let's, uh, just, just to make sure that we get everyone caught up to it, let's read the passage. Mm -hmm. So Revelation chapter 6, let's just start with verse 1, and then uh, the second verse is the white horse. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. So there it is, the background of what you just described. Yeah, now I, I, I sense that you've kind of had a burr in the saddle uh, for some time over this white horse, and you just can't wait to share with us why you think I'm wrong. So let's well, get started. I, I, think, I think you gave <laughs> us some pretty good arguments on that side of it because of the text that you brought from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The four were evil. Mm -hmm. The four horses were all doing evil things, and war and famine and, and, and uh, what was the rest of it? Pestilence. And, and conquest were all evil. Mm -hmm. And when you go to Matthew 24, which we said is a parallel, they're evil there, famines and pestilence you and wars. You got horses in Matthew 24. Well, you said there's a parallel in, the, in the, the consequences, the things that they do, right? Okay. I got this from Dr. Pauline. Mm. So 
<laughs> I'd like, I'll have to meet him someday. <laughs> yes. Interpretation. But I, yes, I switched views uh, years ago. Uh, I'm willing for it to be the other way as a partial fine. Yeah. But it just seems to me more consistent. We always show the four horses in a picture together if we had mm -hmm. power. But I certainly use it in all my Bible studies. There's the four mm -hmm. horses, and they're evil together. And uh, they're not one, and then three, there's four. And I just think hermeneutically, the interpretation, it's consistently is to let them be together in what they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you're saying Zechariah 1, uh, but those are agents of God in Zechariah. Okay. All four of them. Well, that's when we go back to the allow versus causing. Okay, you want to spell that out a little bit? For that when it says God did things, mm -hmm. which he's doing this, or he's pouring things out and evil things happen, we would say it is God allowing things to happen rather than initiating himself. He's not a causing famine, not causing bloodshed and disaster. He allows those things to happen. When, when he said, I'm going to send Babylon to you and take your, pick your people and put them into captivity, that is not God manipulating and controlling. He is predicting that these powers will be, have the freedom to work in that way. It's not God. Okay. Is, there, is there some evidence from Scripture you know, outside of Revelation that, where you could demonstrate that? I mean, that, uh, I think that's a compelling position. You, you've always had two positions among Christians. You've had the, the predestinarian position that God's responsible for everything, even sin, you know, uh, at, the, at its extreme at least. And then you have the, the free will position that uh, you know, God allows us to mess things up on our own and, and, and so on. Uh, what would be evidence from Scripture for that position that, uh, that God, even when God says, I will, you know, tear your hair out and... Uh, give you bad dreams and mess up your future and, and all this stuff that God's really saying, you know, I love you and I'm going to let someone else do that. Uh, I'm sure you have better text than this, but I'll throw a couple out quickly. Uh, in Revelation, I mean in Exodus 15, when the Red Sea, we have uh, God saying, I mean Miriam is dancing around after the Red Sea and he says the Lord's hurled the horse and rider into the sea. Mm -hmm. But when you read the story, all he does is let the waters go back, and it kills people who were there in the wrong place at the wrong time. He doesn't hurl anybody, but it says hurl. Mm -hmm. but we all know it wasn't hurling. It was allowing. A verse I used last night just to tell you a 30-second story. I did a funeral with a family from Berrien Springs. Maybe you'll know these people. Wonderful family. The great-grandmother had died, but three weeks ago, the great-grandson had died. And uh, in a motorcycle accident down in the south at one of our colleges. And I ended up next to the mother who's lost her 19-year-old son three weeks ago. And, and struggling, struggling. Sent the child son to, uh, you know, one of her sons to our school here in California. And she's having a hard time at her picture of God. And I just said, God did not sit up in heaven and choose for your son to die in a motorcycle accident at 19 years old at all. He's not picking the winners and losers. And I said to her, John 10, 10, thieves come in to steal and destroy and take life. I came to give life. So when you take the verse that says God did it and your verse Jesus come down and say, let me be real clear, I don't do that, I do this. Then we have to put the two together and say, Jesus says the enemy has done this. So the evil comes from the other side. And I don't believe God is in heaven personally allowing and choosing every incident of evil to be in the world. That would be unconscionable. Mm -hmm. The kind of the evil that goes on in the world. So you would see God generally letting things go, but occasionally intervening when yes, as I do with my sons. It's critical. Mm -hmm. You know, I am not responsible for every choice that those those boys make, even though they make most of the good choices. We had Father's Day an hour ago. I just came from Father's Day, day breakfast with my sons, and I love them, and we are a great family. But they certainly make choices that I did not choose. I didn't specifically say, okay, you can do that now. I just let them be themselves, and they make some choices of themselves, which way they want to go. And God has, in wanting to create a generation of adults, spiritual adults, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let things go here. And he's not sitting in heaven. I think today I'll let a disaster here, and here I'll let the Loma Linda Hospital be full of cancer, and I'll let uh, the evil. I've pastored too much evil. Someone died today. I got a text as I got out of the car. As I walked in here today, there was a phone call. Chuck Holman's wife passed. Mm -hmm. And she had a stroke, and she's passed. 
I don't think God in heaven is pulling the strings to make all that happen. Mm -hmm. one, one thing that comes to my mind is uh, in Kings and Chronicles, uh, you have one event in which God, you know, destroys David's army because of something that he did. And uh, in Chronicles, it says, no, Satan did that. Same story, same situation. Yeah. Uh, so then the question becomes, I mean, it, it, that looks like a direct contradiction. I think even, does, even yeah. some uh, atheists uh, point out that text yeah. as being very significant. But uh, coming from where you have been describing it, we're saying that God takes responsibility for what Satan does, yeah. but he doesn't actually do it. Now, the, Job is the is the classic where, uh, where you see uh, Satan wanting certain things to happen and God saying, no, that's, you know, that's, that's not appropriate. And then uh, after a while, I say, okay, I'm going to show you you're wrong. You go ahead and do what you think and see what happens. And Alden Thompson in his book on Who's Afraid of the Old Testament, God says, Satan's almost invisible in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And God takes responsibility if it rains and all. What did Job say? You know, whatever it is, okay, I'll, 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 I'll take God. Uh, blessed be the name of the Lord, whatever happens. And then Jesus comes down and he says, okay, you know, I let you have a while there. I wanted you to be clear, I am God. I just want you to get that lesson clear. Now we'll do the second lesson. He's over here too. And an enemy has done this. I would, I would encourage our viewers, uh, you know, off the program, just take a look at Romans 1, uh, verses 18 through 32, and you will see one of the strongest language of the wrath of God you'll ever find. And then it defines the wrath of God three times. It says he gave them up to gave do what up. they wanted to do. Yeah. And that, that's a very, very striking thing. Let me, let me give you one more evidence, Dan. Yes. One more evidence, and that is in chapter 7. Of uh, Revelation again. Yeah. Instead of four horses, you have four winds. Mm -hmm. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. Now, in chapter 6, you have these four living creatures holding back the four horses and then letting them go. Here in chapter 7, you have these four angels with the four winds hanging on to them and then eventually letting them go. The interesting thing is if you go back to Zechariah 6 and verse 5, you discover that these are parallel images. So Zechariah 6 and verse 5, the angel answered and said to me, these, the four horses, are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of the earth. That word spirits is the Hebrew word for winds, breath, and spirit. So the four horses in Zechariah 6 are the four winds. Mm. That suggests to me that the four winds of chapter 7 are the four horses at a later stage. And that would be supportive of your position. I agree with that. And in spite of that, you're wrong. <laughs> so stay tuned. Yes. Next program, you're going to find out why he's wrong. Oh, <laughs> man. Anyway, uh, as you can see, we can see a clock here. We are coming to the end. And so thank you for being with us. Revelation 6, uh, we have to wait a week until we can do this again. But we will uh, come back and we will try to resolve it and go on through these four horsemen of Revelation 6. God bless you all.